Are you there? Miranda, yes, let me know. All right, am I ready to go? I wonder if Trevor or Veranda can send a Slack message so I know. This is what we need for definitely for next time. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone for waiting and welcome to Cal Matters and our latest edition of Getting Through Coronavirus Explained. I'm Vanessa Richardson. I'm the editor in charge of putting on events for Cal Matters. Brown on who we are, what we do, and why we're doing these events. Cal Matters is a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom in Sacramento, and we're committed to explaining California policy and politics to the general public. Right now, the coronavirus pandemic is affecting the state's policy, politics, and of course, its residents. So we decided to put together a series, a regular timely series of events called Getting Through Coronavirus Explained, in which we have our team of Cal Matters reporters talk with California policymakers and professionals who are tasked with getting us through this pandemic healthy and safe. Our previous events have focused on what senior citizens should do to get through the shutdown, and also what employees should do, whether they've been laid off, they've been furloughed, furloughed, or still on the job dealing with stress and what they should do when it comes to filing for benefits, leave, and handling other workplace issues. This week, we're doing our Education Explained, a two-part series in how California schools from kindergarten level to higher education are managing the education of their students during this time of social distancing. And we have two very important guests who are going to be making big decisions for the school districts. With us are Linda Darling-Hammond, the president of the State Board of Education, and Sydney Martin, superintendent of San Diego Unified School District. And your Cal Matters host today will be Ricardo Cano, a reporter who covers K-12 education in California. And we want you to be part of this conversation as well. Please submit your questions by typing them into the chat box on the right hand side of the YouTube screen. Ricardo will ask a mix of reader questions and his questions to Linda and Cindy. Before I, before I turn it over to Ricardo, I just wanna remind you if you haven't already to please sign up for our daily newsletter, What Matters, that's what it's called. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, which you're watching us here on right now and our podcast and consider becoming a Cal Matters member or donor to help us keep doing our nonprofit, nonpartisan journalism on the issues that matter most to you coming out of California's capital. All the information needed to do that is on our website, calmatters.org. And with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Ricardo. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. And thank you to Dr. Darling Hammond and Superintendent Martin for taking the time to um, uh, speak with us and, and uh, help inform uh, folks, uh, you know, what's happening through these very unprecedented times. So um, it's been a dizzying couple of weeks uh, since most schools in the state. And I think a great starting point um, would be if, if um, you, Dr. Darling Hammond, you could give us an overview of what is now required of California's public schools as it relates to instruction and what are some of the usual requirements that schools will be exempt from or have some flexibility from during this time, be it from standard and grading? Well, uh, when the governor issued his executive order, uh, I guess it's been 12 days ago, something like that, um, it uh, provided uh, ongoing funding for school districts. Um, with the expectation that they would be offering distance learning, uh, that they would be providing meals to children and families that need them. I mean, uh, children who are eligible through the federal and state meals um, funding, uh, and also child care where possible for uh, essential workers and especially first responders. Uh, so those are all things that we've issued guidance on at the uh, California Department of Education. You can see guidance 
for um, all of those areas, including lots of resources for distance learning. Uh, and districts uh, have varied in their approach to, dis to distance learning. Some of them have started right away. Others were kind of on break or used that time as a vacation because it was near the spring vacation and are launching their distance learning in earnest now. Uh, and that typically does include digital learning. Uh, we had about 20% of young people in California not digitally connected at home when this started, but uh, districts have been buying um, hotspots by the tens of thousands and creating uh, broadband um, uh, access and connectivity as well as devices. Many businesses have been contributing both hotspots and devices. And I would say most of the distance learning is occurring digitally, although there are also the use of, you know, packets and, you know, uh, the traditional mechanisms for communication. We have uh, various flexibilities around the provision of meals, uh, waivers from the uh, federal government for testing this year. There will be no standardized testing in California. There are waivers from the accountability requirements so that people can really focus on what's important, which is learning and providing care and support for young people. Today, we're going to be posting new guidance on graduation requirements and grading that provide additional guidance for flexibility in grading that districts can figure out themselves. We want children to be held harmless um, so that they you know, carry into this period of time the grades that they'd already earned and hopefully uh, you know, a process by which they can improve uh, on their grades if they uh, are continuing to work diligently but not be penalized for the closings that have occurred. We also have a joint statement with the higher education partners, UC, CSU, community colleges, and the uh, independent nonprofit colleges uh, that provide a lot of flexibilities for uh, juniors and seniors. They will accept um, credit, no credit grades for A through G requirements, uh, where those are choices that are being made by districts, uh, as well as for other courses at this period of time, they're going to provide flexibilities on um, standardized testing. In fact, waiving that for some groups of students for um, financial aid, reconsidering the financial aid that um, children might need, young people might need given changes in family circumstances, um, and then timing of things like transcripts and a variety of other things. So everyone's pulling together to make it possible for young people to continue their education and to do so in a way that is not uh, even more stressful than the stresses that we're all experiencing. Thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Superintendent Martin. We're glad to have you here as, as, as to uh, walk us through what's happening on the ground. Um, you know, we've heard the phrase distance learning a lot in the last few weeks. And for San Diego Unified, what will distance learning mean for students and families? Does that mean homeschooling, uh, learning through paper materials, virtual lessons? And will all educators in your district be expected to follow a singular model for delivering instruction? Or will there be a, a sort of variance from, from teacher to teacher? Thank you so much for having me here today and to Dr. Darling Hammond for that introductory overview and where we are is no, pla no place we'd ever expected to have been just a few short weeks ago. And from the start of this unprecedented crisis, what's been important to us is to remain true to our identity as a district, who we are in San Diego Unified and the decisions that we make um, to meet this moment and the challenges that we have at this point is to ensure that our students have what they need during this unprecedented time. And so at this point, hold on, somebody just joined. I apologize, my screen went blank. Um, it, we wanna make sure the two things that from the very beginning of this, we had to begin to make sure we could make commitments for were student nutrition, making sure our students who rely on schools for their meals, that that would continue. And then it's the continuity of learning. And what you just asked about distance learning, what does that look like from the very beginning? And we're on um, 
day 19 of this, of the school closures for San Diego Unified, we were needing to ensure that there would be a continuity of learning for our kids. And the guidance around remote learning and distance learning that Dr. Darling Hammond just spoke about and that we're hearing come from the state level, we're busy here at the local level, what that looks like on the ground in terms of implementation and making sure that our students are gonna have access to learning. We know how important a classroom teacher is and the brick and mortar of our, of our schools, while we're not gonna be able to learn in the physical environment of the classroom, our challenge is to decide, is to ensure that students will get what they need so that learning can continue. That's a key message that's really important for parents and um, everybody to understand is that we want to make sure learning continues. And that's why we announced that on April 6th is our soft launch of what that looks like. San Diego's in a, in a great situation in terms of our devices through bond measures that we've passed. We have one-to-one -one devices in our classrooms. We're beginning the distribution of those devices and you need to make sure that there's connectivity. Paint a picture of San Diego Unified being the second largest district in the state we understand what equity looks like. It's in our DNA, it's the fiber of who we are. And we, when we define equity, we talk about knowing our students by name and by need. And we talk about making sure that each and every student gets what he or she needs when they need it in the way that they need, that, need it. That's always what we talk about. And that happens in the brick and mortar, but now the context has changed. And so what we do is design distance learning opportunities so kids are able to get what they need when they need it in the way that they need it so that learning can continue and that's starting on april 6th and then we continue with formal grading on april 27th and just a quick follow-up you know what what fact you I, I believe you you uh, san diego was one of the first school districts in the state that um communicated to parents and families that you know, this is the date we're going to have for formal grading. I'm just curious, um, what what did you factor into making that uh, decision for April 27th? Um, and and you referenced a soft launch. I'm curious as to what teachers are, are doing in the interim. You know, what matters is learning. Student learning matters and learning with the teacher matters. And we're currently in spring break. San Diego Unified this week right now is what would have been our traditional spring break. And when we closed on March 13th, we had 10 days worth of instruction that we immediately, if the challenge was continuity of learning in a quickly changing context where state guidelines and regulations and waivers had not yet come through, but we didn't want to miss, we believe a minute missed of learning, a day missed of learning is important. So we started with our continuity of learning on day one of our closures by making lessons available through our local PBS affiliate and also providing 10 days worth of lessons that took us from that first day of school closure to this past Friday when our um, our spring our traditional spring break um, was starting. Then starting April 6th, the reason I call it a soft launch is I wanna be clear to parents and to educators out there, this is an unprecedented time and there's learning happening. Dr. Darling Hammond um, published a report, her and her team from Learning Policy Institute around positive outlier districts. And what the LPI report talked about when they spoke of, uh, wrote about positive outlier districts, they talk about the, the reason why San Diego Unified was identified as a positive outlier district in that report. I mean, Linda, uh, Dr. Darling Hammond, excuse me, you're on the phone. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we talked about when we invest in our educators through professional development, that teacher quality matters and qualified certificated teachers matter in the classroom. And so what's happening now is we're in this learning mode where professional development for teachers while they're learning to deliver remote instruction, distance learning, and making sure we have the connectivity of our students. Our students are in any manner, all different kinds of students which may or may not have connectivity. You can have 6,000 students in San Diego Unified identified as experiencing homelessness. How do we make sure that they have the devices they need to continue their learning and the connectivity that they need? Our students with disabilities ensuring that the service delivery model is going to work for them and our English learners. And all of that is the key to what Dr. Darling Hammond always talks about is professional development and the importance of that and the identity of this district doesn't change as we meet this crisis. Thank you for that, uh, Cindy. And we have our first question from, from the audience. Um, this one is from Susan Summerfield, the first grade teacher in Oakland Unified. 
And Susan asks, how will the state assist families who do not have access to electronic devices or do not have access to internet? Um, how will the state support students, uh, especially the younger students who um, don't have adequate support or supervision with an adult to consistently engage in online learning? Um, some of this was covered in the recent press conference today with Governor Newsom that you participated in, Dar uh, Dr. Darling Hammond. So uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, some of this, obviously, this is a place where the state can help and where the district, you know, and the schools need to lean in, as um, Cindy just described in San Diego. But we are a SWAT team that we've kind of assembled uh, between the governor's office, the state board, and the Department of Education to secure hotspots and devices. Um, and districts, of course, are doing that on their own. Um, Cindy didn't go into all of this, but they've done enormous work to get uh, all of the electronic pieces of this to work for families that don't have the devices and the Wi-Fi. Um, and so many districts are doing that. We are also getting contributions. The governor announced that Google will provide 100,000 um, hotspots, um, which we will get to, to those places that need them the most. And if there are places in Oakland that are in that situation, they will be on that list along with other districts that are you know, uh, trying to get everyone wired, so to speak. Uh, we also will get about $2 billion from the federal government very soon, which can be used for technology uh, needs. It can also be used for things like summer school. And so we're beginning to conceptualize the learning process as, you know, that we're breaking through the, you know, the box, so to speak, uh, and starting to think about what are all the ways in which different kids are going to need supports to learn. And some of that's going to happen in the traditional school year, but a lot of it's going to happen over the summer. And maybe people will also rethink the way in which they start the next school year. We're going to put resources toward that. Um, toward the question of what do we do for young children who don't have you know, all of the supports and supervision at home, I think that's such a really um, uh, important and um, heart-rending question. And uh, for all the parents who are trying to, in some cases, continue to work jobs, um, and they have you know, kids at home and need childcare, the other thing we're trying to do is a stand-up childcare in the state for those who don't have a parent at home because they are an essential worker and need to, you know, be out doing their their work. And also, you know, I think districts are beginning to think about how do we provide for parents the kind of professional development we're providing for teachers <laughs> so that they can know how to work with their children at home. And I think we're going to see more and more of that over the coming weeks and months as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, another reader uh, audience question from uh, Christina Baumgartner, an educator in Tuolumne County. Um, what is the most important thing school districts can do now to support their least advantaged students, particularly those who are already struggling academically before uh, this crisis? And what districts should we look at to as, as models in this regard? I think maybe Cindy should take a, a first stab at that one. Oh, I appreciate that, Dr. Darlingham, and thank you, because that's been what has been 24-7 all I have been thinking about and problem solving is what we do in San Diego defines equity and access forevermore. This is a challenge of our generation. This is a challenge not just from the healthcare perspective, but way the way we as educators meet this challenge and what we do with this time actually shows truly who we are and we will be changed for it. And so if we design something to ensure a continuity of learning that works for some and doesn't work for all, then we are off mission. Our mission has always been in San Diego Unified with over 105,000 students, over 50 languages spoken, many English learners, many students with disabilities, all of the inter different needs that we have is what we're designed to be able to meet every day. Now we have to design our approach so that we will still be able to meet that. We want learning to continue. It's so important with the announcement that just came out before we got on live here from our governor about the physical closures of schools 
till the end of the year. It's really important that we lead right now as educators and the message is out to our students that learning matters. Schools closed, learning is not. And so how do we ensure that that happens? And this takes individualized approaches like it always does. In the classroom, teachers know how to differentiate, know how to provide individualized supports, and that will continue. It will be in a very different context and learning matters. And so what we're doing, Dr. Darling Hammond referred to some of the really detailed technical things that San Diego Unified is doing in terms of the equipment, that we're making sure our students have devices, they're making sure that they have connectivity, whether that's through a hotspot or through wired service in their homes. A homeless student that by definition doesn't have a home may need to have a hotspot to be able to access their learning. But that differentiation, this is what teachers know how to do. Our teachers love to teach. Our teachers want to be back with their students. They know they can't do it in the classroom. So we are designing the professional development our teachers get to be able to learn how to do this in a totally new setting. But we still will provide that and get the message out to the kids that the learning continues. We need to show across the state that we're taking this seriously. This is a very serious process because you know what? Our kids are watching us right now. They're watching us as a state. They don't all understand what's happening. They're beginning to understand, but even our youngest learners, they're looking for meaningful, purposeful learning to do right now. And that is our charge to provide that to our students, even though we have an unprecedented change in the way in which we provide it. We're ready to meet that challenge and our children deserve us to do that. Yeah, I just want to add a footnote, which is um, on the state CDE website, on the COVID-19 website, there are uh, their distance learning guidelines and a set of resources, which include resources for meeting the needs of students with disabilities through That's distance right. learning. A lot of people have been tapping those resources. I know a lot of school districts are using them. They do provide guidance for how sometimes um, what I'm hearing about our uh, teachers will call the family. Um, get, you know, actually get a little IEP, you know, meeting kind of going on the phone. Talk to the parents about the way in which that set of guidelines is going to be met through distance learning. Sometimes it will mean that the student um, gets assistive technology devices that go along with their, you know, other devices um, that allow them to get uh, audio books. Uh, you know, rather than, um, you know, visual or that, you know, vary the modality of instruction. Sometimes it means that they will get paper uh, packets rather than um, technology because that's more appropriate for their particular needs. Um, but when that's working best, the uh, teacher will also communicate with the parent about ways that the parent can take advantage of the modifications and accommodations that the child would have been receiving um, in school. So, because a lot of times parents don't know what their child is getting in, in when they're in the physical uh, environment of school and how to actually help them, you know, uh, learn in the ways that, you know, when the teacher is there, they can do. And then many teachers are doing their work with kids, you know, face to face um, on the computer, uh, online. Sometimes they have the whole class there in their leading class. Uh, sometimes they're working with small groups um, and they'll communicate in variously one on one in small groups and in large class. So, um, you know, there are different ways that students with disabilities are getting the help that they need. And we encourage people to use those resources, um, you know, to support the work that they're trying to do, um, you know, from the uh, vantage point of teacher and of, and of parent. I can give another example to that too, Dr. Darling Hammond, around students with disabilities. We see teachers already using um, an environment like Zoom or Google Meet. That's what we're using here for this environment. And there's an ability to have breakout rooms. And so yeah. teachers delivering a whole, a whole class lesson, let's say it's a math lesson, and it's at a scheduled time that students check into the lesson. But let's say you have three or four students that have identified goals in their individual education plan we can set up a breakout room where they're then working with the paraprofessional and the paraprofessional that is typically working with the student in a brick and mortar is now going to a virtual breakout room with teachers supported, the, the, the planning happens like it normally does, but then that paraprofessional is able to provide some of the services that they would have done in the classroom through the technology that we've set up. Concrete example like you gave. Absolutely. 
and um, we're we're gonna keep it rolling. Uh, certainly, getting getting questions, several questions. Uh, this question comes from Amalia Cunningham, a mother of a fourth grader and a sixth grader. Um, Amalia says that she's fortunate; her husband is caring for their kids full time struggling to get through uh, instructional materials. She worries that her kids um, aren't going, will not have met uh, grade level standards when they start school next year in fifth and seventh grade. Malia asks, will, will entire students be advanced to the next grade level regardless of achievement uh, comp or comprehension of, of you know, their current learning standards? A question that, that uh, you know, a lot of parents are asking is, uh, will school start earlier in the summer uh, to cover prior year's material, or, or are there discussions about extending this current school year into into summer? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I'll I'll just uh, get the ball rolling and then punt it over <laughs> to okay. Cindy. Um, one thing that I think lots of folks are thinking about is that you know when when kids come back. What, in whatever form we go to school next year, because we don't know exactly what the timelines are going to be and when brick and mortar starts again and how much of this will be distance learning. But uh, educators are keenly aware that they're going to need to sort of evaluate, you know, where kids are uh, and, you know, maybe review and, and you know, uh, reboot a little bit of the end of the year information that was going on. And I think there's great uh, awareness and empathy and support. Um, for, for children um, that, you know, their um, districts and schools uh, are, you know, experiencing. So I don't think parents should worry. Uh, they should try to keep the kids engaged. As Cindy says, the learning is going on. Learning does not end. School is in session. We want to keep them moving and growing. And by the way, when they're involved in things that they're really interested in, whether it's like a project or whether it's some kind of exploration that they may be doing, they will, you know, we are natural born learners. So they will be learning. And um, everything around them is a learning experience. So parents should think about how to take advantage of that. Um, and they're smart young things and they will use their minds. So, you know, the schools are thinking about how to, cover the content standards and they will give, um, you know, uh, attention to that when school resumes. I don't think it's possible to predict the schedules yet just because we have to wait and see how this unfolds. But I think there's going to be resources coming from the federal government and probably from the state to help us, you know, make up the time. Cindy? Yes, thank you. I want to say thank you to Amalia if that was her name for asking that question because every parent in the state is asking that question and it's coming from a place of real concern and it's the same concern we all have about learning matters and how do we make sure our kids get this year. What we announced in San Diego was that this academic year is saved. We are going to have San Diego Unified starting that's why we said we had to put this date in place april 6 and get this learning started because we need this year to count our learners need the opportunities to learn and i really appreciate amalia's question i'm working very closely with the pta here in san diego we're going to do a, a zoom town hall meeting with parents because those kinds of questions are coming up and we want to stay engaged in in that dialogue because parents are truly concerned and they're worried and they're worried for the right reason so the, the first worry is just students' lives have been disrupted. The normalcy and the routines that they're used to and the friends that they're used to seeing and their teachers, that's all concerning. And parents worry when they see kids being taken out of a routine due to no fault of their own. So that's why we think learning is so important right now because it gets a sense of normalcy. There gets to be a routine. There gets to be something that can happen. And I want to say to our parents, and Amalia, you're speaking for thousands of parents across across California right now. Be gentle with yourself as a parent. Get, be patient with yourself, with your child, your family, the routines and the structures. You're not having to take the place of the teacher. We have highly qualified certificated teachers that are getting ready to do this teaching and the parents are big partners in this, but being gentle with yourself on that. There's, you know, I worked in City Heights here in San Diego for 10 years as a teacher and a principal with a school that had 100% poverty, many, many English learners, almost 90% English learners. And 
when I think about what would we be saying to our parents right now and how are we going to keep learning going, focus on the learning and then focus on the preciousness of this moment in your families. What's happening globally is hard to char characterize as precious, but the family time, there are things that you can be doing right now for learning. Like Dr. Darling just, Hammond just said, children want to learn. They're built to learn. So I really suggest families use this time. Keep a journal. If you can make sure that you're writing every day, this journal is going to be something that goes into your family's history. This moment a generation from now, when your children are grandparents, their grandchildren are going to ask them, what did you do? And if you have a daily journal of what your family did, is there a story time that you're doing together? If you're worried about math and science, there's cooking and having kids come up with the recipes and do the cooking and the measuring. There's things that you can do that make learning continue. And yeah. the standards and being able to meet the standards and all that by the end of the year, as Dr. Darling Hammond just said, we will ensure those standards, what we have to compact to make sure we connect, we, we get the content covered during the time that we have when we go back to learning. That's our job and we'll do that. But I can't stress enough how important the learning is right now. And, you know, family time to make sure is the family doing something with art and music every day. The arts matter. They, they matter every day when school's in session, school's in session. And are you bringing music and art into your home? And are you connecting to other family members? I, I suggest every family finds at least one senior citizen that they're connecting to and calling every day so that they're, I'm doing it with my mom, we're FaceTiming with her every day. But is every if every family in the state picks one senior citizen that they know are isolated and alone, that's part of learning. That's part of communicating. And when we talk about social emotional learning and this connectedness, we are all in this together. And what you do as a family with journaling, which is which is writing and reading stories together and cooking together and calling each other, those all hit on core content standards that Dr. Darling Hammond and I could tell you what standards you're meeting when you do all that at home. <laughs> and we will bore you with that. But I promise you, as a family, if you do those things and you have a routine and can build some sense of normalcy in this unnormal time, you are going to be adding great value and educational learning to your children. And I thank you for asking that question. Well, let's all thank Amalia. And uh, let's uh, question from uh, Vanessa Garza. You know, he, she is referencing um, figures that Los Angeles Unified uh, School District released earlier this week, uh, basically um, showing that about 15,000 high school students in, in LA have been absent online or haven't done any schoolwork since March 16th. And Vanessa asked, what support can school leaders get to, to help these students who, who are MIA? That's mission number one for us in San Diego is that we reach and find every one of our students, which is why I've said it already on this call and I'll say it again. We need to show and signal to our young people that we are taking this seriously. When they hear, I mean, it's about responsible messages from the media. When families and children hear, oh, school's closed till the end of the year, that cannot, we cannot have the message be learning is over. And so this idea of uh, these signals that we message right now as educators, as parents, as principals, as superintendents, as teachers, as anybody that cares about the viability of a public school system during a crisis has to help message to our families and our community and our students, learning is continuing. That's why grading matters. That's why these this this these this time will count. And we're gonna use this time to make sure our students are learning and connecting to their teacher and to their learning and that we're guiding that learning for them. It is critical that these messages are strong and powerful, that learning is continuing right now. So we it is mission number one. We've already started connecting. We have our Office of Students and Youth in Transition that are reaching out to our refugee community, making sure we found every single student that's part of that community, every student that's part of our, that, that's experiencing homelessness. And our teachers, 
know how to find kids, connect to kids, and there's all manner of ways that we're going to do that. And it is led through the powerful relationships that our principals and our teachers have at the local level with their children. We love our children and the children love the school. The school is beloved and it's a key part of the community. And we're going to be clear, learning matters. And we're go- we will find you and you will keep on learning <laughs> because that matters. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Darling Hammond, uh, I wanted to make sure that we got through this question because there are a couple parents who've, who've um, asked some sort of version of this. Uh, you know, in some communities, uh, I understand that that situation has been fluid for, for schools on the ground. But uh, in some communities, we're hearing from parents who are frustrated that they've had little or no communication from their teachers in schools about instructional plans be it because their school district might still be negotiating with their labor partners or because their district has been of the mindset that, you know, we can't start engaging families until we figure out how we're going to equitably serve all of our students remotely. Um, You know, what is the state's expectation for when schools should begin engaging parents in in distance learning, either only? And, And do you believe that the state can or should step in and give more uh, prescriptive directions to schools on when they need to, you know, have this process started? Well, I think that uh, initially people were wondering, were we closed for two weeks? You know, is this just an extended spring break? You know, uh, people had spring breaks scheduled at different times. So it has been an uneven, you know, process of when uh, districts, you know, got in gear, but it is happening now. And virtually every district is right now, if they haven't already posted a distance learning plan and reached out to their families, it's happening this week. And I've got lists and lists and lists of districts that are going online. You know, they went online last week or this week or next week or the week after. And I think that within the next couple of weeks, uh, everyone will have heard from their school districts about what the distance learning learning plan is. The other thing that districts have been trying to do is get hotspots lined up, get devices you know, uh, lined up, and there's actually a you know, shortage now of devices in some places, and they're waiting. And so some places know that they're going to get their devices next week, and you know that will be the beginning of the uh, process. So there is you know quite a bit of planning to do. There's professional development to do for teachers so that they know how to use Zoom and Google Hangout and all of that. And uh, they've got some tools for how to work with students who have a variety of needs. And they've got translators available where near, where needed for kids. So I think that's that for, from a parent perspective feels like, you know, what's going on? We don't, you know, yet have uh, a clear uh, plan. But I think that we're going to see over the next couple of weeks, virtually every district in the state will have um, gotten those things resolved and, you know, gotten uh, a plan with parents um, activated. Thank you for that. And um, we we certainly covered this before, uh, but it is uh, something that a lot of parents have inquired about, including Elisa Backstrom. She asks, as high school students, uh, you know, will not be completing uh, the, the full curriculum this semester, you know, how is that going to affect their, their college admissions applications? Um, and, and what are some of the, you know, how will, um, how are students uh, expected to compete in the admissions process? So um, the universities, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of weeks working with them. And if you go on to the CDE website at the end of the day or early tomorrow morning, you'll see both the guidance for graduation and grading and also statements from all of the higher education segments about how they're going to uh, respond to students. And there's a lot of compassion and empathy and um, creativity that is being brought to bear. Uh, We do expect that districts will help students graduate. Um, And if they were on track for graduation, you know, before the closure, they should continue. Uh, And there are strategies for grading that will not disadvantage them for the closures and the many, you know, kind of wrinkles that can occur with that, but that will get them engaged in finishing up. There's also online courses that will be posted. All the high school A through G courses and other high school courses are available online. And if you're in a district that 
for whatever reason, can't um, satisfy every need of every student. Some students may be in credit recovery mode, et cetera. There will be also resources for them. The colleges and universities are going to accept the, whatever kind of grading that the district decides to do, letter grades or credit, no credit, and do it in a way that does not disadvantage students' grade point averages. They're also aware that students may not be able to access all of the uh, courses that they would otherwise have wanted to access, um, you know, AP courses and other things that, you know, students try to stack up all these things. Yes. And they're really moving towards looking uh, at each application with an eye towards what the school has been able to provide. So the school profiles will be um, asking schools to put into their profiles that the colleges look at what they have been able to provide so that the colleges can think about each student's application without disadvantaging the student for what was or was not uh, fully available. Uh, and, you know, uh, standardized testing is going to be optional for those uh, juniors who would have been, you know, trying to do it right now and, and next year for the um, following uh, years uh, admission. So there's there's a lot of, and each sector has a lot of flexibilities that will be posted. So parents who are worried about that should go take a look at the CDE website, COVID-19 page, and um, find those, I would say, wait till tomorrow. They'll be posted late today. And we appreciate at the district level, we appreciate all the advocacy that you and your team have been doing to make sure that was happening. When we announced our plans to, for learning to continue starting on April 6th, that was really big and important news, especially for our seniors that had plans. And we knew this guidance was probably coming, but we were simultaneously getting our learning plans going and a distance right. learning plan coming fresh out of the box, getting you know true to our values around, around equity and get meeting needs for each and every student. But we put our key founding principles in place right from the start. We're supporting our educators while they transition to this. We're providing access for all students and we're going to maintain teaching and learning and getting that out of the box and knowing that you have been working so hard at the state level to make any kinds of waivers that are necessary, state testing. So we sort of have been on simultaneous tracks, but we're not waiting for those decisions to happen. We've got to get the list distance learning started because as you know, professional development was key. We popped up professional development right away that our teachers are already engaging in remotely so that we can make sure our lessons are adaptable, simple, and intuitive and flexible and respect for the educators moving into this whole new world and having many different on-ramps for teachers to be able to do this so that we can get to that graduation that this caller was asking about is how are our kids going to graduate? They're going to graduate with this year under their belt and their transcripts complete because we'll deliver that learning. I, I think I need to be clear on what you said earlier about summer school. We are pushing every effort to connect to every single student and we have to be clear that we might not find them all we might not connect with some and we need to be thinking about the plans because core value is learning is going to happen this year is not lost this year does not need to be lost and the plans that we're putting in place is for it not to be lost and some of the kids that we may have lost during this transition they come back when this is over. If they've left, we're, we're down in San Diego. Some have gone to visit family in other places. They might come back and we need to think about summer school. We need to think about how to save the year for the kids that for whatever reason, no fault of their own or ours, we weren't able to connect with them. It's not, oh, well, game over, you lost the year. It's nope, we got a plan for you too. So I know the state is thinking about that too for whoever we can't reach. We will make sure our kids learn because learning is why we exist. Thank you for that response, Cindy, um, and Dr. Dolan Hammond. Uh, you know, uh, we talked previously, but I want to make sure that for the folks who maybe just tuned in, uh, because this is a, a pretty um, uh, urgent question that we're hearing a lot from our, our audience. Uh, Martha Camacho asks, my daughter has uh, an IEP, an individualized education program. How do I help her? Well, the specific ways to help um, Martha's daughter are unique to that student, right? Every student with an IEP has different needs. But one of the things you can do is reach out. I think teachers are going to be available both online and by phone, you know, to work with parents and find out from the teacher 
uh, what are the strategies that uh, the, the teacher has found most helpful for that child? And then how will the assignments that are going to be um, made available to the whole class, you know, expected to be modified for that student? And I think you'll find that as teachers are, um, you know, getting the training and mounting the systems for distance learning, they're going to be ready to have those conversations with parents. And as Cindy said earlier, sometimes the paraprofessional, there may be a paraprofessional who's involved, there may be a special education teacher in addition to regular classroom teachers um, who will be involved in helping parents figure out how to uh, make learning possible for that particular student. Sure. And um, uh, we have a question from Rebecca Swanson. She's a teacher in Hesperia. Uh, wanted to let you know, uh, Linda, that she, she's, a, she's a big fan of yours. Um, <laughs> and it's actually going to, you know, she's not going into live stream because uh, uh, her and some of her, her colleagues are, are uh, you know, uh, doing a drive-by through, through their, their uh, students' neighborhoods because That's she true. says they, they miss their kiddos. Uh, that Rebecca is asking is, you know, I'm a teacher and uh, I want to reassure my families that working with them and, and talking to their children is paramount. I also want to reassure them that they shouldn't overwhelm their children or themselves, but still try to find a way to keep as normal schedules they can. How can I get this message to them in one resource or in a more personal way than the letters and items that I'm sending home? Well, it sounds like that she's doing a drive through the neighborhoods, and I hope standing six feet away, <laughs> if, not, if knocking on the door, <laughs> to deliver that uh, message. I do think that families really do benefit from schedules, and I've seen a lot of schools and teachers posting, you know, um, possible schedules. Uh, you know, sometimes there are schedules of I'm going to be available, and our classes are going to happen at this time. But here's what you can do with your kids for, you know, cooking or out of door play or other things that allow them to, you know, know how to structure the time in a productive way for that kid. And I, my head is off to her for her effort to make that personal um, connection. Um, and a lot of folks are also trying to do that by phone to be socially distant and uh, connected at the same time. Sure. I, pr I appreciate that question that she asked too, because teachers are wanting to know, is there a best way to connect? And we go back to our core values. Our core values are, are around differentiating, knowing our students by name and by need. The way you connect with one family is going to be different than another family. And there's no way to have a one, there, by, there's never a way to have a one size fits all approach to any type of, type of education and especially now. So I would encourage her, like, what works for your families and your students? Some it's by phone, some it's some in paper, some it's they're putting up Zoom classes. And I've talked to a te some teachers have their Zoom class up and running and 14 out of 20 students have signed in. So she's finding the other ones that are missing and finding a different way to connect if that doesn't work. And by the way, that theory of action of how do we reach out to our kids? What's the best way of doing it? All good teachers know that's what they do every day in the classroom. When you're right. teaching a lesson in the classroom and most of the kids got the lesson and some didn't, it's never the student's fault when they're not learning. That's always the educator coming up with another way and another way and another way. And teachers are so creative and innovative and the kinds of innovation that our teachers are coming up with right now about how to reach their students they do that every day in the classroom and they're doing it now just the walls are down they are finding all of these unbelievably innovative ways and our job at the, the state level job and the district level job is to support our teachers to make this happen this is what we are here to design for our for our teachers so our educators know we are here we are in this together we're going to support them to reach their students in all the manners that would be helpful for our students to continue their learning that's who we are Absolutely. And um, I want to thank you both for, for participating. We have one last question. And really, I just want to um, give the floor to you guys for a quick minute. Um, you know, these are obviously unprecedented times for parents, for teachers, and for uh, California 6.2 million students. And I just was wondering if you had any final message for everyone who's tuning in and, and, and who's 
the, the reality that we're all dealing with right now. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that this is a challenging and stressful time for everyone. Um, but there's so much inspiration in this time also about how people are trying to support one another, about the ways in which public schools are continuing to be sort of, you know, hubs in our communities uh, and touch points. Um, I think that there's a poss there are possibilities for us to come to the other side of this um, further ahead in some areas than we were. Uh, I think there's the opportunity for families to experience a kind of closeness. Um, you know, and uh, interpersonal uh, bonding and creativity that um, is often not possible when we're rushing around doing all the things we do in the world that is, um, you know, usually uh, occurring. I think that um, in our education system, we may have many, many, many teachers and students who come out of this experience uh, also more technologically literate and able to engage in the, you know, kind of high-tech world around us. Um, we're having to close that digital divide very rapidly. It's interesting how, you know, some of these inequalities have gone on for years and years and years. And in a matter of weeks or months, we make huge progress on getting some of the learning tools to kids uh, and teachers that, you know, they need to be 21st century citizens. Um, I think that um, we'll all learn a lot about how to use those tools not only in this moment, but also in classrooms when they are brick and mortar again, uh, for a lot of the kinds of research and project work and uh, innovation that kids, you know, uh, need to be able to engage in to be good um, citizens as well as employees in this, you know, high tech economy that we have. I think we're also going to find that um, kids are very resourceful. We know that we are natural learners, and the ways in which children learn and, and young people learn may become more clear to them and they can guide their own learning um, in the future more productively. Again, that's part of what it is to be uh, a, a successful 21st century citizen. I Finally, I think I'm just going to quote the governor here from his earlier press conference. Um, you know, the, the society is um, coming together and uh, policy-wise, we're doing a lot of things to level the playing field and to take care of people in ways that we weren't, we may end up in a much more progressive era of how we uh, as citizens take care of one another uh, in our policies and in our state uh, and certainly in our schools uh, as a result of this. So um, these kinds of big events transform societies. And at the other end of this, I hope we will be, you know, better um, human beings, citizens, parents, uh, educators uh, in a more equitable context than we uh, had when we entered this moment. Well, I thank you, uh, Linda and, and Cindy, for your time. Uh, really, we appreciate it. And, and certainly thank you to our audience who tuned in. Uh, Vanessa, I'm going to leave it to you. Thank you, Ricardo. And thanks again very much to Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond and to you, Cindy Martin, for joining us for a very timely and very relevant discussion. And for those of you who uh, were sending in your questions, thank you again. If you have more questions for our two guests, please email them to us at info at calmatters.org, and we'll send them along to Cinda and Lindy's office. Cinda, Cindy and Linda's offices. <laughs> If you missed any of this discussion, you can watch it again or listen to it later. This video will be available at our website, calmatters.org. It's also going to be here living on our YouTube page. We're creating a separate audio podcast of this conversation as well, which will also be on our calmatters.org website. And our podcast hub, that is soundcloud.com slash calmatters. We are reporting on all things coronavirus all around the clock. So for all our coverage about the coronavirus outbreak in California, subscribe to our newsletters at calmatters.org slash subscribe, and also visit our special page dedicated to that topic at uh, calmatters.org slash coronavirus. And again, if you are able to support our nonprofit, nonpartisan journalism at this very crucial time, please make a donation via our homepage at calmatters.org. All those websites I gave you are also the places you can stay tuned for our upcoming Getting Through Coronavirus Explained events. We have tomorrow's part two of our Education Explained series, 
And at 1 p.m., same time as today, we'll be interviewing Tim White. He's the chancellor of the California State University System. We'll be asking him how his 23 schools will be handling online education. In the meantime, please stay healthy, stay strong, stay safe. Thank you again for joining us, and we will see you here next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks.